Evening, everyone. Amen. Amen. So tonight, we're going to bring the book of James to a conclusion. And it's been a great journey. Thank Jesus. I've certainly learned a lot in it myself, and it's challenged me in a lot of different ways. Yeah. And, and I suppose, in a way, I hope that's done the same to you guys as well, in your own individual ways, that it's, it's challenged you. And I've fallen more in love with the Word of God as I've done it, and it's helped me. And we're going to bring the book of James to a conclusion tonight in James chapter 5. But let's pray first. Amen. Jesus, we thank you that we can come together here tonight in spirit and in truth and worship you, Lord. And I do pray, Jesus, that you would teach us from your word tonight as we humble ourselves, myself included. We want to hear from you and hear what you're saying to us through the power of your word. Let it challenge us and build us up and help us to be the men and women of God you've called us to be in these days and these times. Jesus, we love you. You are the King of kings and Lord of lords. We worship you in spirit and in truth. Let your Holy Spirit him, let him be here with us tonight, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So just to recap chapter four, it's over a month ago, about six weeks ago now, five, six weeks ago, we learned that our hearts were wrong at the time. Sometimes, okay, sometimes they were wrong. And because of that, we were at war with God and we were at war with ourselves and a war in ourselves because our hearts were wrong. And Jesus, through James, gave us a solution to that, which was to draw close to God in humility, resist the devil, and cast all our cares on him. And we need to remember that when we gave our life to Jesus, we came out of the authority of the devil and came under the authority of Jesus, like Jesus did in chapter 4 of the wilderness. So we can speak with the power and authority that Jesus has given us. So we need to remember that. And also, we were told that our life is a gift from God. And we're called to invest in it and not waste it. Every day we don't know how long we've got when we're going to be called home. So we need to be investing in our life, not wasting it. And that means drawing close to God, making time for him and all this kind of stuff. And putting him first, really. And now tonight... We will finish the book of James, James chapter 5. And James wants to leave three final keys with us before he closes the book in a very abrupt way, right at the end, in the way, which is how he writes his book anyway in his letter, quite abruptly. <laughs> he wants to speak to us tonight regarding how we are with the stewardship of things, whether that's money or possessions that God's blessed us with. He wants to talk to us about patience and perseverance, and he wants to talk to us about prayer. And they're the three male keys that he wants to leave with us tonight. So I'll read from uh, James chapter 5, verse 1. So it says, Go now, you rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered and the rust of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. You've heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold, the hire of the labourers, which have reaped down your fields, which is of you, kept back by fraud, cries. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. You have lived in pleasure on the earth and have been wanton. You have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and killed the just, and he does not resist you. So here we can see that James is talking about people who love money more than their neighbour. And these were people at the time who were quite wealthy, rich people, and they've decided to hold back the wages of people that they've employed to do their work because they love money more than them. And James is talking about these people are now in trouble because of that. And the cries of the righteous have cried to God and he's heard them. And because of that, God will have vengeance for them. And James is warning of that. And he's warning us that anything that God's, it could be money or anything that has blessed us with, that we're to be a good steward of the possessions that he's blessed us with, whether it's money 
or possessions. We're to bless out and not hoard it. These people hoarded it, and because of that, it got God against them, and God's not happy. In 1 Peter chapter 1, I've going to got quite a lot of scriptures tonight, but the first one in 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, verse 3 and 4, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that doesn't fade away reserved in heaven for you. So that's our inheritance for us in heaven. It's not physical or tangible things that we've got here. It's a blessing we've got them. But we are... Our blessing is in heaven, which is worth much more than the physical money or possessions that we've got, and we're called to share those things. Also in Matthew 6, Jesus is talking, Matthew 6, um, verse 19 to 21, I think it is. He says, don't let yourselves treasure on earth, where moth and rust is corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But let yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth and rust doesn't corrupt, where thieves don't break through or steal. This is the key bit. For where your treasure is, there's your heart also. So these people's hearts were with the money and possessions that they had. And it wasn't with God, it was with their money that they had. And because of that, it eroded the character and changed them into people that weren't right and acceptable in God's eyes because money corroded them. And money's a... Good um, servant, but a terrible master, isn't it? That's the thing. And whether it's money or possessions, in this case, James is talking about uh, money. The overall theme of this chapter is that we're to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. James, the overall theme is that, and then under that are the three points. To be a good steward, to have patience and perseverance, and prayer. But the overall theme is to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. That's the main thing that he wants to say, but under those three categories. In Romans chapter 8, uh, verse 5, it says, For they that are after the flesh mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So we're blessed with life and peace because we're putting Jesus first and the blessings that he's given us, we're handling in the right way. Now these people were wealthy land landowners at the time and they had cattle and it says here, I think from verse... Uh, It says about them having cattle um, and really condemned for the day of slaughter. Yes, sorry, yes. So it says in um, verse six, sorry, verse five, that they've lived in pleasure in the earth and they nourished their hearts as a day of slaughter. Now, these people had cattle at the time preparing their cattle for slaughter, but they didn't know at the same time they were being prepared for the day of slaughter. And they didn't know it. So as they prepared their cattle for slaughter, so they were being prepared for slaughter. So the cries of the righteous went into the ears of God, and he wasn't happy with them. Remember, God's the final judge, and he has the final word. And they loved their money more than their neighbour. And the key is, we shouldn't love our money or anything else more than people or around us. We shouldn't love our possessions more. And I think I remember when I was um, going through a bit of financial trouble in the past, but I was still tithing to God. I was still trying to do it the right way. And, but I was going through a bit of financial hardship. I kept it to myself. And I came back home one day, and there was a letter in, through the post to the door, and I opened it, and it was, inside was two £50 notes and a scripture, which said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And to this day, I remember, and to this day, I still don't know who blessed me with it. And I thought, wow, two fifty pound notes in the scripture, and I held on to that. And I felt, thank you, Jesus, for that, because I was tithing, but only God knew that I was struggling financially. But because I think I was doing my tithe and stuff, and 
What I had, I gave in the right way. That was just my testament of finances, but it can be related to possessions as well. What I did with the money, God saw that and blessed me back when I needed it. And these people weren't doing that, they hoarded it. And whenever we need to be a flowing, blessings need to flow through us. If we hoard it, it stops God blessing us, others. Just, I mean, we need to be flowing, it needs to be flowing through. And then God will allow God to use us to bless to other people rather than hoarding it and keeping it. So God wasn't happy. And in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 to 15, we all know this one. Okay, so it says here, 13, so, uh, for brothers, you have been called unto freedom, but don't use your freedom for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. So that could be helping each other and blessing each other. So Mick blessed me, bless him, with my car, and I blessed him with a coat that was too big for me. <laughs> and he just said to me just now, thank you so much for that coat, because in the cold, when I've been waiting at the bus stop, it's really helped me. And I said, Mick, bless you, because you blessed me. Amen? Really, you did. Thank you. So, it's like, otherwise, you'd be hanging in my wardrobe, just hanging there. But I think that's the way to do it. God uses us to bless each other, and then blessings can flow in love. Amen. And then also, um, Galatians, the same chapter, chapter 5, verse 16, it says, This I say, walk in the Spirit, and you should not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are the contrary, so you can't do the things without them. But if we're led of the Spirit, we're not under the law. And then it goes on to list on what the fruits of the Spirit is and what the fruits of the ungodliness is, really. So that is the main message in the first section of James chapter 5. He wants to drill that home to us. And I think it's important to remember that. Now, the second part, we'll go through it, is the patience, not put patience stroke perseverance, the patience to wait and the perseverance to keep on waiting. So we'll have to wait, patience, but then perseverance to keep on waiting. So it says, be patient, therefore, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waits for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience for it until he receives the early and latter rain. Be also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draws nigh. Don't grudge one against another, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge stands before the door. Take, my brothers, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. You've heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. But above all things... Don't swear, neither by heaven nor by earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yes be yes, and your no be no, lest you fall into condemnation. Now the first section was focused on the oppressors, and now we're focused on the oppressed, the righteous. And that's what's happening here. And the key verse, with the whole chapter, chapter 5, revolves around is verse 8, where it says, Be patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draws nigh. So James is saying, whatever's going on, keep your eyes on Jesus and not the problems. Jesus is coming back for us soon. He's coming back soon. When the book of James was written, that was only 30 years after Jesus ascended to heaven. And these people were impatient then. 2,000 years later, no wonder we're still impatient. <laughs> but the thing is, we are to keep our eyes on Jesus. He's coming back. The test is, Will we endure even if he doesn't come back in our lifetime? That's the test. Will we stick it out? Will we keep walking the walk even if he doesn't come back in our generation, in our lifetime? Okay. So I've put as patience to wait and the perseverance. Now we're praying for people in the church right now. We have to have patience. Remember, God's timing, like Kev said, is different to our timing, but it's perfect. His timing's perfect. We want things straight away, quick. But his timing's perfect. And to be honest, if we had the things that we wanted in our timing, we'd fall flat on our face. He knows our perfect timing. And when we 
I suppose can handle it or deal with it, whatever it is. And our own personal journey. This week I was in Chipping Norton for work. And um, bless him, they give me a hotel and a company car to go there. But it's a blessing in a way because when I lock my hotel room at night, and this week I did it, I just thanked Jesus. I just had my quiet time with him there and it was beautiful. I just felt him with me and things that I'm waiting for in life right now. You know, but I just felt God just say patience in, in my perfect timing, you know. So we need to bear that in mind. Remember, God is patient and persevering with us, and we need to be the same with God, patient and persevering with him. Now in Revelation chapter 3, uh, verse 7, Jesus is talking, and it's the message to the churches in Philadelphia. And he says, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these things said he that is holy, he that is true, he that has the key of David, he that opens and no man shuts, and shuts and no man opens. I know your works. Behold, I've set before you an open door, and no man can shut it. If you have a little strength, and you've kept my word, and have not denied my name, behold, I'll make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they Jews and not, but lie. Behold, I'll make them to come and worship before your feet, and to know that I've loved you because you've kept the word of my patience. I also will keep you from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly, hold fast which you have, that no one takes your crown. And that can relate to verse 8 in chapter 5, where he says, Be patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draws nigh. So when he's coming, he's coming quick. And we're to keep our eyes focused on Jesus. And he's coming quick. And Jesus acknowledged them and blessed them and said, you kept the word of my patience, your tribulation. I'm coming quick to take you out of it. And that's going to happen for us. Jesus is coming back. We don't know when, but he is on the way. And that is the main focus in this. Yes, we go through trials, patience, but don't keep our eyes on that. Keep our eyes on Jesus. He's coming back soon for us and he's going to take us away to a better place. There's many um, scriptures relating to patience, one of the fruits of the Spirit, patience. But it's, it's vital for us to keep on patient. And he even mentions it here, the patience of Job. And we can't, I suppose, not look at that. I know everyone knows the story about it, but we can't not look at that without going to it, I suppose. So if we go to Job um, chapter 1, uh, verse 20. And he was going through a lot of uh, trials at the time. Okay. So Job arose, after all this happened to him, rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down on the ground and worshipped and said, naked, I've come out of my mother's womb and naked I'll return. The Lord is given, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all this, Job did not sin, nor charge God foolishly. So in all of his trials, in all his tribulation, he kept his eyes on God, and he didn't do anything wrong in the eyes of God. He trusted in God that he was going through the situation, and God was in control of it all. He was in control of all of it. And he focused on God and not the situation. And that's what we're called to do. And then even... When he was tempted in his work in chapter 2, verse 9, when his wife said, curse God and die. <laughs> but he says, you speak as a foolish woman. Show you receive good at the hand of God and not evil. And in all this, he still didn't sin with his lips. He kept his focus on the Lord. And that's what we need to do. Keep our focus on Jesus. Remember, we only see a little bit of the picture, but God sees it all. And remember, a thousand years in the sight of the Lord, is but like a watch in the night. It's nothing. So, that is the key verse out of that chapter. Verse 8 in James. And then, in verse 12... 
it relates to when we were talking about the tongue and how we need to be careful with our tongue and what we say to people or say to God. And he's just rewarning us there about that. Above all things, don't swear, neither by heaven, neither by earth, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, lest you fall into condemnation and your words will put you in trouble and it'll be hard to get out of them. So that is the second, I suppose, part that uh, James wants to leave with us. Patience and perseverance. Remember, the patience to wait, the perseverance to keep on waiting. We're praying for Joan, we're praying for Tim. God knows the needs in the church, we're praying for them. And it will happen. It will happen. We walk by faith, not by sight. Look at Alan, hallelujah. It encourages me to see him here. Thank Jesus. Amen. That's right. And Keith, all these people. Yeah. So he does. So Joan will be with us soon, and Tim will be, and all those other people that are waiting in the time that God has ordained for them to be back here with us. Amen. And it's at that time that we'll be <laughs> have so much joy, even more. Amen. So, so far he's telling us to have the patience of Job, and as we go into the last section, he wants us to have the prayer of Elijah. Prayer and confession. The last part. So verse 13, he says, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if you have committed sins, they'll be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another, that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed that it would not rain, and it didn't rain on the earth by the space of three and a half years. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. I'll stop there for a minute. So James has mentioned prayer twice already in this letter. Back in January when we started, he mentioned in chapter 1, verse 5 to 8, he says, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience, but let patience have a perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And then he says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask, that gives to all men freely and upbraideth them not, and it should be given him, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that waves is like a wave of the sea driven the wind and tossed. So he said, pray without doubting. That was the first thing he said, pray without doubting. And then in the last, in chapter four that I did about five weeks ago, chapter four, verse three, he says, you ask and don't receive because you ask amiss that you may consume it in lust. So at that time, our hearts were wrong. So we shouldn't pray without doubting and we shouldn't pray if our hearts are wrong. He now wants to teach us the right way to pray. And the right way to first of all pray is confess our sins, make sure our hearts are right with God, and pray without doubting. But remember, sometimes our prayer doesn't get answered in our timing, and sometimes it doesn't get answered, but we're called to pray anyway in faith. But God's the overall, he knows it all anyway. But we're called to do what we're to do. And he wants to teach us the right way how to pray in chapter five. Now, it says here that the elders in the church are to anoint the sick. Now, you notice that in James, he doesn't say the sick should do anything. Usually when people are really sick, they rely on other people's prayers. Like Joan, bless her, she's relying on our prayers. Tim, when, you, when you're really sick, it's hard to pray. It's hard. Helen relied on our prayers. and Praise the Lord, here he is. So when you're sick, James knows that. He didn't say, sick person, get up and pray. If you can, great. But if you're really sick, they're relying on other people's prayers to bring them through. Prayers of their brothers and sisters. That's what he was saying. And when the elders anoint them, then it's not the oil that heals, it's calling on the name of Jesus that brings the healing. When healing comes, it's a blessing from God. The oil represents his Holy Spirit, but it's calling on the name of Jesus that brings the healing. Amen. So our hearts have to be right. Now, I didn't know much about Elijah, so I had to study the book um, so it brought me to 1 Kings. 
Um, so I wanted to learn a bit about it, really. First uh, Kings chapter 17. So Elijah was living in a time where Baal was around. This idol Baal. And there were a lot of Baal worshippers. And Elijah had a motive and he wanted to turn the people's hearts back to God, the true God. Baal at that time was supposed to be the God of weather. He was supposed to be in control of the weather systems and all that. But by Elijah praying to God and shutting the heavens up, it showed that it mocked Baal. <laughs> and it showed him that Baal isn't the weather God. He's not the one in control here. The true God, living God, Jesus Christ, he's in control. And that was his agenda. He wanted to turn the people's hearts back to the true God. And in doing so, mocking Baal. And it was also a direct challenge to Baal. <laughs> who was supposed to be in control of it all then anyway. So it reads, And Elijah the Tishabite, was of the inhabitants of Gilad, said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Get hence and turn eastward, and hide yourself by the brook Cherith, that's before Jordan, and it shall be that you shall drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. He dwelt by the brook, that's before Jordan, and the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up because there'd been no rain in the land. <laughs> so he did what God said. He was obedient. He prayed. No rain. And if we skip to 1 Kings 18, verse 25... And Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one bullock for yourselves and dress it for your many, and call it the name of your God, but put no fire under it. And they took the bullock which was given them, and they dressed it and called the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor anyone that answered. And they leapt on the altar which was made. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he's your God, either he's talking or he is pursuing, or he's in a journey, or he sleeps, and he must be woken. <laughs> and they cried aloud, and cut themselves with knives and lances, till the blood gushed out on them. And it came to pass when midday was past, and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, that there was no voice, no answer, nothing from their God. And then Elijah said to the people, come near to me. And all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And if we skip down to verse 36, it says, And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are the God in Israel and that I am your servant and I've done all these things at your word. Hear me, Lord, that these people, here we go, know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their heart back again. That was his motive. He wanted to get the people to the true God, the true living God. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones, and the dust licked up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And Elijah said, Take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook and slew them. So, it worked out okay in the end. He was a man of prayer, coming close to God. And look what God did for him. And that's what we need to be. And that's what James is saying. He wants to have us to have the patience of Job for our trials and afflictions and the prayer of Elijah. Not doubting and believing these things to come to pass. Okay. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 4. Let me stick these tonight. Okay. Hebrews chapter 4, uh, verse 14. It says then, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, 
Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which can't be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all things tempted like we are, yet without sin. Here we are now, verse 16. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So Jesus wants us. His arms are open wide to us, coming to him in prayer. He wants to help us and embrace us. He wants to hear our prayers and answer them in his timing. He won't turn his back. We've got that promise here, that he's here with us, that he, he loves us. and he's, Sometimes just his times are different to ours, but he's hearing every prayer that's going up. And at night when we're all asleep, he's got his same angels assigning them to different people, different things, different situations. Amen. Now, there was something good which I picked up on. Now, Elijah, when he prayed, it was three and a half years, which is equivalent to 42 months. Three and a half years is 42 months. 12, 12, 12, 36 plus 6, 42. So, if we go to Revelation chapter 13, verse 5, we're talking about the Antichrist here. Revelation 13, verse 5. It says, there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. That's three and a half years, the same time that Elijah shut the heavens up for. Three and a half years, 42 months. And I thought to myself, wow, there's something in that, but I don't know what, to be honest. But it's like, maybe it could be judgment. I don't know. Because the world turned against God, the Antichrist, came on the scene. And he had power for three and a half years to hinder us. And then Elijah, the prophets, had gone to Baal. They'd worshipped the wrong god, an idol. So God said, right, no heaven, no way for three and a half years. Punishment. So it could be that. I don't know. It was just an interesting fact that I, point up, I picked up on there. Now, I've deliberately left verse 19 and 20 to the end. Well, because of the order, but I didn't read it all through. <laughs> <laughs> so it says, If any of you stray from the truth and one convert them, let them know that he or she which converts a sinner from the error of their ways shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. He's talking about one of us here. If any of you go from the truth, not an unbeliever, he, he says, if any of us stray from the truth, then we need to convert them back by the prompting of his Holy Spirit back into the right path. And in doing so, something amazing happens. They're saved from spiritual death and loads of sins are hidden. Hallelujah for that. And that's how James finishes the letter and the book. No grace and peace and love multiplied unto you. But he started it abruptly and he ends it abruptly. The way he is through Jesus Christ. But what can we take from this chapter? So, we're called to be a good steward of what God has blessed us with. Whatever that is, money, possessions, two hours, whatever. Time. And remember, the overall theme is to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. And they were the key points from that. To have patience and perseverance, patience to wait and perseverance to keep on waiting until God blesses us in that way. And, but thank him for what he's done. He's done so much already. I forget, he's done so much in our lives. Oh, it's like the human nature always want a bit more, but of patience and perseverance. And we need to remember that he wants us to be like Job, the patience of Job and the prayer life of Elijah, like those two people that he mentioned. James doesn't just want us to grow up, but he wants us to mature spiritually. And that's what the whole theme of the letter has been about, for us to mature spiritually. And through these, I hope since January, since we've been doing it, these little nuggets of helping us to mature spiritually. He's dealt with every area of our life. My prayer is that it's blessed you all, as it's blessed me. Thank you your patience with me. Amen. Amen. Amen.